Good morning. The message I'm going to bring to you this morning is Man on the Middle Cross. Uh, before I do that, I want to share a, a devotion that I read on November 26th. It's really fitting to this message. There's a scripture of Galatians 6, 14, which says, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know the power of God, that is the resurrection life of Jesus in your human flesh, you must dwell on the tragedy of God. Break away from your personal concern over your own spiritual condition and with a completely open spirit, consider the tragedy of God. Instantly, the power of God will be with you. Look to me, Isaiah 45, 22. Pay attention to the external source and the internal power will be there. We lose power because we don't focus on the right thing. The effect of the cross is salvation, sanctification, healing, etc. But we are not to preach any of those. We are to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2, 2. The proclaiming of Jesus will do its own work. Concentrate on God's focal point in your preaching and even in your listeners. And even if your listeners seem to pay no attention, they will never be the same again. If I share my own words, they are of no more importance than your words are to me. But if we share the truth of God with one another, we will encounter it again and again. We have to focus on the great point of spiritual power, the cross. If we stay in contact with that center of power, its energy is released in our lives. In holiness movements and spiritual experience meetings, the focus tends to be put, on, put not on the cross of Christ, but on the effects of the cross. The feebleness of the church is being criticized today, and the criticism is justified. One reason for the feebleness is that there has not been this focus on the true center of spiritual power. We have not dwelt enough on the tragedy of Calvary or on the meaning of redemption. Grammy-nominated artist and songwriter Rhett Walker has a song out titled Man on the Middle Cross which after listening to it many times and focusing on the lyrics, it inspired me to deliver you this message this morning on that basis. Walker is known for pushing the envelope and writing songs that come from life lived and lessons learned. His songs ring out through small town USA as anthems about family, faith, and making the most of every day you get. Listen to the lyrics of the song, Man on the Middle Cross. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to sing. That, that would be brutal on your eardrums. The lyrics. I heard the preacher talking about three wooden crosses upon a hill for everyone to see. Two sinners on the outside couldn't save themselves as they tried. All I could think is, man, that sounds like me. I've been the one on the left full of guilt and regret, long gone on the wrong side of living. I've been the one on the right, always looking for a fight, thinking I could never be forgiven. I'm standing here today overwhelmed by grace because I know who paid my cost. Thank God for the man on the middle cross. He didn't have to do it, but for me, he went through it. A love like that, I'll never understand. Lord knows I don't deserve it, and I know I couldn't earn it, but mercy rained down on this desperate man. The cross is where he went. Oh, but that ain't where he stayed. He brought me back to life when he rose up out of that grave. Someday I'll stand before him and I'll see Jesus face to face. I'll worship and adore him for a life forever changed. Amen. Walker says about his new song, 
I came across a clip of Alistair Begg's sermon on social media, and he was speaking about the two men on either side of Jesus on the cross. The man on the right ends up in heaven. The angels in heaven stunned are asking, how are you here? You weren't a follower of Jesus. You didn't live a life worth gaining heaven. And the man said, I don't know how I'm here or where I am, but the man on the middle cross said I could be here. Walker continues, this message was such a reminder that grace and mercy have nothing to do with us. There's nothing we could do to earn it and nothing we could do to deserve it. It is only and always has always been only been about Jesus, who he is, what he did, and the grace that he continues to pour out, which is why I thank God for the man on the middle cross. So with that, I want to share with you a short and powerful story that teaches the gospel of grace. You can't beat the story of the thief crucified next to Jesus. Now, I've asked my wife Carol to come and read scripture from Luke 23 and Matthew 27. This is Luke 23, 32 through 43. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? So save yourself and us. But the criminal, the other criminal, rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God? He said, Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished just, justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And in Matthew 27, 38 through 44, the two, re the two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Thank you, Carol. May God's blessing be on the reading of his word. So this text presents three men. It speaks of three men who have been nailed to three crosses, dying three terrible deaths. The differences in their suffering were minimal. The differences in the men, however, were enormous. On one side, there is a thief dying in, in his sins. He has lived a life of crime, broken the laws of Rome, 
and has been sentenced to die. The sentence is being carried out and this man is dying a horrible death. This man is rude, arrogant, and proud. He is in a hopeless situation. He is dying in his sins. On the other side, another thief is dying for his crimes. He is just as guilty as the first man. He has committed the same crimes, offended the same government, and has received the same sentence. He is paying the same price, feeling the same pain, and dying the same death. Yet he is different from the first man. While the first man is dying in his sins, this man is dying to his sins. This man is well aware of what he is facing. His eyes are open to his condition, and he is willing to do what it takes to get God's help. Yet he is still in a hopeless condition. And in the middle, another man hangs on a cross. He has offered some very, he has offended some very powerful people. This man has spent the last three years traveling around the country preaching a message he calls the gospel of the kingdom. It is a message that promises salvation to all who will believe it. This man has healed the sick, fed the hungry, and raised the dead. He has done nothing wrong except to expose the corruption of the religious leaders of the nation of Israel. The Jewish leaders have convinced the Roman governor that this man is worthy of death. Since the Roman governor is afraid the Jews will start a revolt if he lets the man in the middle go, he gives in to their demands and orders the man in the middle to be crucified, even though he knows the man is innocent. The man in the middle is very different from the other two men. He is so different from others because he has never done anything wrong. He has never sinned. He has never committed a crime. He has never treated anyone badly. Yet he is feeling the same pain, paying the same price and dying the same death as the guilty men on either side of him. This man, the man in the middle, is dying for sin. That is what makes him different. From every appearance, this text appeals a this, from every appearance, this text details a hopeless situation. Three men are nailed on three crosses. Three men are dying terrible deaths. Three men dying deaths so horrible that we cannot imagine how bad they were. By the time the sun goes down, all three of these men will be dead and in, and in eternity. It really is a hopeless case. Our Lord Jesus is able to bring hope to the hopeless. Our Lord is able by his power to transform any hopeless situation into a time of hope and blessing. So let's examine the case of the dying thief and note the ways this passage teaches us that there is hope for hopeless cases. And as you know, two thieves were crucified next to Jesus. One trusted him and received salvation and the other did not. This morning, I want to walk through the story of the first thief, the repentant one, sometimes called the penitent one or the penitent thief. And I want to present it in four different parts. The first one, both thieves mocked Jesus. Crucifixion by design drains the life and energy out of, out of a body. Matthew tells us in his account that the two thieves used the little breath they had to mock Jesus in Matthew 27, 44. In doing so, they adopted the same behavior as the religious leaders and other onlookers who witnessed his death. Now, Jesus was not surprised to hear the mockery or to be crucified between the two thieves. Jesus quoted and fulfilled Psalm 22 when he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Psalm 22, 1. And in that same Psalm 22 also says, All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me and they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. That's Psalm 22, 7 through 8. The second part, the repentant thieves recognized his sinfulness. While one thief hurled insults at Jesus saying, are you not the Christ? 
save yourself and us. The repentant thief chided him. Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And, are, and we are indeed punished justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Luke 23, verses 39 through 41. What a stunning transformation. This thief no, this thief no longer mocked Jesus. Now he defended him. What changed? We don't know when the repentant thief began to fear God, but we find clues when we look at the scriptures and think, and think what the thief experienced alongside Jesus. John narrates that, narrates that Jesus died before the robbers in John 19, verses 32 and 30 through 34. This means that the repentant thief was able to observe everything that happened when Jesus was on the cross, including his cry, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We do not know what the thief thought when he heard these words, but it's not difficult to imagine that something like the following went through his head. If he was ready to forgive the man who drove the spikes into his hands and feet, maybe he was ready to forgive me. The third part. The repentant thief believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. After an internal transformation, the repentant thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Luke 23, 42. The thief believed that Jesus was a king with a real kingdom. Normal kings don't die on crosses and certainly have no kingdoms after death. So the thief believed that this king was more than an earthly king. He was a savior king able to take him to his heavenly kingdom. The fourth part, the repentant thief, thief was saved by Jesus. Jesus answered, answered the repentant thief with the most hopeful words possible. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. A thief who woke up in the morning on his way to hell had his eternal destiny changed with a simple plea to the Savior, Jesus, remember me. So what does this story mean for those of us as believers or those who may doubt or those who may be seeking or those who are still lost? This story reminds us, first of all, that salvation is a gift from God. And the repentant thief had no time for good deeds. He couldn't repay those he had stolen from, help the poor or be baptized. He also did not have a sophisticated faith and he probably would have failed a Bible knowledge test. All he could do was look to the savior with faith and ask for mercy. And that's all he needed to do. The experience of the repentant thief is a perfect illustration of the biblical truth that salvation is a gift of God's grace that we will receive through faith and not by works. We can see that in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 and Titus 3 verse 5. This story of the repentant thief shows us that no sin is too bad to be forgiven. And the repentant thief had already received a death sentence for his wrongdoing. All we know about his sin is that the scriptures call him a thief and a criminal. This sin, according to the world, deserved death. However, according to Jesus, it was forgivable. And we are reminded the death of Jesus is enough to pay the debt of all our sins. We see that in Romans 6, 23. What the sinner has to do is acknowledge and confess his or her sinfulness and ask Jesus for forgiveness. Ultimately, this story means there is hope for all of us. And the repentant thief believed in Jesus Christ in his last minutes. And this is proof that God will show grace and forgive the sins of all those who believe in him, even in their dying breaths. This is a glorious truth. 
But you might know this truth and think, I'll live the way I want to now and trust in Jesus later, or when I'm older, or I'll just trust Jesus on my deathbed. Well, two questions expose the recklessness of thinking this way. How do you know you'll have an opportunity later? How do you know you will want to trust Jesus in the future if you don't want to now? The truth is, we are like the thief, and sin is sin. We have sinned against a holy God and deserve his wrath. One day, every human being must appear for judgment. We see that in Hebrews 9, verse 27. In closing, what caused this one man to change his mind about Jesus? What caused him to turn from a blasphemer to a believer? Maybe it was the way Jesus was silent as they nailed him to the cross. Maybe it was the way Jesus responded to the mockery of his enemies. Maybe it was the sign over the cross of Jesus that proclaimed his title. It could have been any number of things that spoke to his heart, but something told him that Jesus was no ordinary man. Something told, told this dying man that Jesus was his Messiah and that Jesus was his only hope. As he hangs there in the presence of Jesus, this man confesses to himself to be a sinner. He declares his own guilt for all to hear. He says, I am the man, I am guilty, and I deserve everything I am receiving and all that I am about to receive. I can hear in his words the sorrow of a wasted life. I can hear the sorrow over wrong deeds, wasted opportunities, and shattered dreams. I can hear a man who is sorry for what he has done and for what he has become. He is a repentant sinner. And when he called on the Lord, he was saved. Is that what you need to do today? Do you need to confess your sins and call on Jesus for salvation? If so, come to him and he will save you. If you have already responded to the gospel call, and God saved you, you ought to praise him for that. What do you think the thief did when he met Jesus in paradise? I have no proof, but I think he bowed before the Lord and worshiped him, thanking him and praising him for the salvation he had received. You see, it's only about Jesus. So I leave you with this. As we saw in the story of the thief, there is hope for everyone who humbles themselves before God in faith and repentance. If you do this, Jesus will say to you with joy, truly I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Seeing and worshiping. Jesus made a promise to those early disciples that he intended for every disciple. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. That is Matthew 28, 20. We gather with other believers to seek Jesus in the worship of singing, praying, and teaching. As Christians, we don't leave Jesus in the manger. We also see Jesus, no, we also see Jesus around the table of the Lord's Supper. This table is not just a reminder of Jesus' death, but also his last promise to all his disciples. As we eat the bread and drink from the cup, we celebrate that Jesus remains faithful to all his followers and that he is with us always. So now take your cup, take the bread, represents Christ's body broken for us. And take the juice, which represents Christ's blood shed for us. All right. Dear Heavenly Father God, I come before you to ask that you bring us all closer together this Christmas as we worship your son's arrival to the earth the first time, his birth, Lord. 
I pray that you bring us closer and that you heal us from whatever is afflicting us, whether physical, mental, or spiritual, Lord. I pray that you be with the church, and I pray that along with being with us, I pray that you be with the non-believers, and that this Christmas season that you bring them closer to you, Lord, so that they may know you. God, help us to do that, Lord. Help us to bring those who don't know you closer to you, Lord. In thine holy name I pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.